Hi, and greetings from Lutheran World Relief's offices in Baltimore. My name is Nicole Hark, and I'm the Deputy Director for the Asia Middle East Region, and I'm here to talk with you a little bit more about the Syria refugee crisis. My background is largely focused on North Africa and the Middle East, both academically as well as some of my work with LWR. Within the Asia Middle East region, over the last five years, I've overseen the programs that we have in Palestine, Syria, Iraq, and now expanding into other areas as a result of the refugee crisis. So I look forward to sharing more with you about our programs. For a moment, though, before we begin, I'd really like it if you can close your eyes and just take a minute to visualize your own home and think a little bit more about your neighborhood and your neighbors. Think about the landmarks and the buildings that are nearby. Think about the services that you're used to, your trash pickup or your recycling, your postman or postwoman. And just imagine for a minute how you might feel if those disappeared in an instant. Think about the conversations you might have with your neighbors when a building's gone, or if you hear from a coworker that someone else has left, and what you might do if you hear rumors that your community is next. Do you trust those rumors? Do you think about the safety of yourself and your friends? Do you, do you wonder whether you're better off staying where you are, or if you're better off risking the unknown, uprooting your family? and moving somewhere else, you'll find something else. And I think if you can think about that and, and what it might feel like to question those difficult, impossible choices, you'll start to put yourselves in the feet of a refugee and really understand what it is that we're talking about when we're talking about the migration and, and movement of all of these millions of people. It's important to me, I think, that we understand a little bit about the terminology because our language is important, words are important, and how we talk about refugees, who's a refugee, um, makes a difference. You know, we, we were talking about seeking refuge, trying to find safety, and really a refugee, the, the definition is specifically to look at people who are fleeing war, natural disasters, escaping persecution, um, they're, they're fleeing because really they have no choice. They are seeking refuge. They need to be safe. Um, that's slightly different from another term that we use often, which is called IDP, or internally displaced people, which are, although I know it gets confusing, not actually legally refugees. Um, IDPs are people who are also fleeing because they're not safe. They may be fleeing war or persecution. They're trying to find safety, but they haven't actually left their country. They're not crossing an international boundary. And for our purposes at LWR and for much of the rest of the international community, that distinction is important. Um, and particularly when you're talking about what the future may hold for those people and, and how we help them. Um, so I just want to keep those terms in mind. You might also hear the term migrant, which is really general. I mean, think back to our ancestors who migrated in search of food or warmer weather, um, you know, geese who go south for the winter. Migration can mean a lot of different things. And there's economic migrants who are seeking better opportunity, just as there are migrants who are fearing things and leaving for safety. Um, so we tend not to refer as much to migrants compared to refugees and IDPs. In addition, there's two other terms that I want to make sure I mention because I'll reference them, and you may hear about them also on the news, but UNHCR is an acronym that stands for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, and that is the UN Refugee Agency. Those are often the frontline staff who are cataloging individuals, trying to ensure basic services, and working with governments and other organizations like LWR to support these people. In addition, there is another called UN OCHA, the Office of the Coordinator of Humanitarian Affairs. And they work oftentimes in tandem, but UN OCHA is specifically for emergency response and humanitarian coordination. So for an organization like LWR, UN OCHA is the body with which we have to work most closely to ensure that 
we're communicating what we're doing, we're understanding what governments and other organizations are doing, and we're making sure that we're doing the most effective and efficient work in collaboration with all of those other partners. So before we dive into the particular realities of what the situation on the ground is in Syria, I'd like to take just a minute, just one minute, and show you a brief video that you and Ocha put together. And it's five years in 60 seconds. And I think it gives a great snapshot of what's happened in the last five years. One of the things that I really like about this video is that I think it does a great job of capturing in the last five years the uptick in migration for people leaving Syria. You may have noticed in the last two years the photos increasingly focused on people moving, whether they were leaving in droves or just small families, but notice what they're carrying, what they're taking, and just sort of walking to wherever the next destination may be. Some of you may recall, going back to 2011, 2010, the Arab Spring, um, which was popular throughout uh, countries of the Middle East and North Africa, but was also present in Syria. And it's from that that we originally see the roots of some of this conflict. Um, the Arab Spring in Syria was relatively peaceful up until about March of 2011, when there was government firing upon protesters and then, of course, escalation as, as protest groups start to become armed groups and fight back against the government. And admittedly, it gets far more complicated from there. Now, in Syria, there are several different groups. Even among the groups that are fighting against the government, there are different groups. Um, and I think it's important to just note a few time periods, as we've seen in the evolution of this civil war, that have taken it from what would have been just one country's civil war to a broader global issue. Um, in 2013, some of you may recall, President Obama gave an address to the nation in which he noted that we had proof that the president of Syria had used chemical weapons against his people. And for many in the United States and as well and around the world, this was evident of international war crimes. It was evidence that there needed to be a global response. That at this point, what was previously maybe termed a, a civil war had now really escalated beyond control. Um, later on, another year or so, maybe six to eight months down the line, many folks are now very familiar with the household name of the Islamic State, ISIS. Um, and we saw their, their rise to power in Iraq and Syria, and in particular, their sort of splintering of some of these armed rebels within Syria to form this group. Um, and as things have evolved, and particularly our own security concerns in the United States, there's been a lot of discussion about how terrorism and war and refugee problems are all interconnected. Um, and certainly, for us as a humanitarian organization and for you as someone who is welcoming people to this country and trying to figure out how to help those who are still there, um, it's really hard sometimes to separate the needs of vulnerable people who are affected by the war with what you hear on the news and the devastating issues involved with the war and the very real security concerns and terrorism threats that we all worry about every day. Um, I think for us, as LWR and for other agencies, um, what was most alarming is that the focus on terrorism, the focus on the war, has oftentimes meant that there is not as much focus on the human need. And there hasn't been as much focus on what are these refugees doing? What are they facing? How can we help them? Um, you know, we'll leave Washington to figure out what to do with ISIS and how to tackle the complexity of who's at the peace talks, you know, how we get to a better position for that country. But until then, there are still millions of people in need of help. Today, UN OCHA estimates that over 13.5 million people are in need of humanitarian support 
And within that, there's 6.6 .6 million still within Syria, and about 4.5 million who have fled the country. And you might wonder, where are they going? Um, in many respects, I think when we hear about it on the news in the US, it's because we're worried about, well, who's coming here? Or who's going to Germany? But in fact, the vast majority are going to neighboring countries. Uh, Jordan, as you'll see on this map, just south um, to, of Syria, has received 34% of that population that's fled. Uh, Lebanon's taken in 26%, Turkey, 24%, Le uh, Iraq, 13%. And as you can imagine with Iraq, folks that have left there have sometimes ended up going somewhere else after because that in and of itself is not necessarily a safe environment to flee to. Um, so there is quite a lot of, of people who are not coming to the US or coming to Europe, but who are still in need of support in the countries where they are. Um, Lebanon has had its own conflicts in the past. Jordan was already serving millions of Palestinian refugees, and now they have again welcomed millions of Syrians uh, into their homes and into their communities. Of the more than 851,000 refugees who entered Europe last year, what many of us saw on the news last fall, um, only about 50% or so are from Syria. Um, the rest tend to come from Afghanistan, about 25%, um, North Africa, Libya in particular is one area, and many other countries, because of course, as I mentioned before, economic migration is just as um, vital and necessary in many, in many cases as it is refugees fleeing for safety reasons. Um, but just to give you a picture that not everybody is going where you might see on the news. Oftentimes, they're not going very far at all, um, and they're restarting their homes in an environment that is somewhat familiar to them and with the same language and a lot of the same customs and cultures that they're used to um, in neighboring communities. So as a result, what LWR's work is really focused on is helping in those neighboring countries and communities. Um, our support to date has been targeted in two geographic areas. We focused first on the wave of immigration that was going up through Europe. So this is where you saw last summer and fall folks arriving in Greece, thousands by the day through votes going into Hungary, um, continuing on up through Serbia and Croatia. LWR's funding that was raised over the summer was targeted in those countries to help welcome those individuals as they arrived. Since then, our programming has also expanded into Syria itself, and now we're expanding into those neighboring countries, looking specifically again at Jordan, as I mentioned before, and Lebanon, whose capacity to welcome people is getting stretched almost to its limits. Um, I think it's important also to know what kinds of support do people need. I mean, if you can imagine leaving your home, leaving almost everything you know behind, and starting out fresh somewhere new, you need pretty much everything. Um, you know, you, you need shelter, you need water, sanitation, hygiene support, basic things like toothbrush, toothpaste, that's probably not the essential item you grabbed on your way out the door. Um, you also need food, uh, non-food items, so things like clothing, blankets. Um, all of those things are provided for people when they arrive and often provided because of the support of indivi individuals and congregations like you. Um, we are doing our best to try and meet the needs of these populations, but honestly, the needs are growing every day. And it's hard to, even as an international community with the UN, these governments, international organizations like LWR, to really fully meet the needs. There's also the somewhat intangible needs, what we call psychosocial support. The idea that you're also dealing with people who have been through something terrible that you can't even possibly imagine and you have to help them cope with that even as you're helping them find safe shelter, have food, um, you know, comforting that spirit as much as you're comforting the body and comforting, you know, in other ways. And so I think psychosocial support as we talk about it and protection, um, again, as is the terminology, 
is also an integral part of all of our programming because number one thing for any humanitarian organization is to do no harm. We, we can't possibly make this situation any worse. We have to make it better. And I think the most important thing in that is to acknowledge the, the psychosocial needs as much as the tangible needs like shelter, food, and non-food items. Within Syria itself, um, I have a map that's shaded which areas we can work in. Not all of them are safe to operate in, but in the areas that we are, as I mentioned before, there's six and a half million people internally displaced within Syria, and oftentimes their biggest need is around food and non-food items. Um, we hear stories of people going into debt because they're borrowing money to buy food for their family. Uh, and so oftentimes our programs are specifically targeting small cash for work. And the reason why that is so important in my opinion is because it gives them a choice and it gives them a livelihood. And with that comes a sense of pride and an ability to provide for their family, which again, going back to that psychosocial, it's hard to, to really articulate what that means for someone, but to be able to work, to earn some money, and then be able to buy what they need, whatever that is, if it's food, if it's clothing, if it's school books, however they define for themselves what's most critical for their family. Um, so those small cash for work projects are taking place across Syria and providing income at a household level for individuals to then purchase what they need. In addition, as we look at neighboring countries, we're looking at things like shelter, water programs, uh, as well as additional non-food item distributions. One of the blessings that we have at LWR is that our own Quilts and Kits Ministry provides us with so many items that we can give out, particularly for people who are arriving with nothing. So since 2011, we have sent more than $7 million in material resources to support over 330,000 people. And that's across six countries. So as I mentioned, these people are going all a number of different places, and we are trying to reach them everywhere they go. Um, and I think those materials are just as important, if not more so, than the other things that we do, because it tells them that there's someone else thinking of them and wanting to provide something for them. And so I thank everybody who does quilts and kits, because I think it gives us an opportunity to accompany that with our additional programs and say, here's a little something more, because we know that you came with so little. So I just want to thank you both for your support of our programs, for your support of Quilts and Kits, and for really your interest in this situation. I think, honestly, that's one of the hardest things in my job is that I hear the stories daily. I read the news so often, and I'm confronted with the reality on the ground on a daily basis. Um, so it's ever present in my mind. But I know that sometimes it's hard when it's an ocean away and when you don't know anyone who's personally impacted. Um, but I can tell you that there are millions of people impacted. Women, men, boys, girls, people from all walks of lives, um, all jobs, you know, students, it's, it's really everyone. And I think that the more that we can try and think of them, pray for them, um, you know, support them in both psychosocial and other programmatic ways through LWR and through the work of other organizations, I hope that there will be a brighter future for Syrian refugees. Um, you can learn more about what we're doing at our website, which is lwr.org. And I would also invite you to um, learn a little bit more about particular stories of individuals that we're helping and some of their experiences that we've heard to date. Thank you again.